Okay, good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. We'll call the meeting to order on, let's see, today is Tuesday, the 8th of, Feb of March at 6.02 p.m. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Back to Finch. Any changes to the agenda? No changes of communication. All right, thank you. Uh, discussion items, let's just jump right to the data summit, the 2022 mid-year data review. All right, well, you heard me do the data summit a couple of times, and so I thought it'd be nice to have Stacy Drake, our assistant superintendent, put together the data for our mid-year review of the iReady. That's the data we do fall, winter, spring. So we have fall and winter to compare. And so Stacy has a PowerPoint for us. So I think we'll ask the board to go ahead and go into the audience so we can see the PowerPoint and Stacy will take us through the data. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share some really um, great mid-year data with you on um, reading and math for K through eighth grade students. Okay, so this first slide shows you um, where students placed on the winter diagnostic, it's called. So the winter diagnostic was given mid-January about into early February. Um, it places students either, you know, the dark green, it's a five, five point scale, dark green it is mid on grade level or above. The lighter green is early on grade level. Yellow is one grade level below, two grades level below is the light red, and then the dark red is three or more grades below. So at, at mid-year, we would really want our students to be early on grade level. And of course we would love for them to be mid on grade level or above. So this slide shows um, several different components. You can see where we are in the middle there, district. Um, we had 3,534 students that took the um, winter assessment. And that was a 98% completion rate, which was really celebrated by the iReady folks. They said that was one of the highest um, completion rates they've seen. So, you know, we were excited about that too. And we can't really analyze our data if it's not all of our students taking that data. Many of the students who did not complete the assessment, it just wasn't an appropriate for them um, for various reasons. So we felt like we captured a good um, group of, of our students. So there's the district. First column to the left, national in-school population to date winter. So this is nationally across the country. Um, how many uh, are the uh, um, levels of where students placed that took the iReady diagnostic? And then to the left of that, historical national norms. Um, you know, we're using really winter data from 2018, 2019, which, which is pre-pandemic, <laughs> to measure us uh, where we are. That's really where we'd like schools to get back to, that pre-pandemic rate, because um, that was the last complete year that I ready has national um, normed data for that the students actually did fall, winter and spring assessments. Um, and then to the far right is just the state of Washington. Where do we compare? So you can see that in our quest in West Valley School District to get back to pre-pandemic um, rates, we're looking pretty good. So 28% of our students who took the assessment 
are either mid on grade level or above. 21% are early on grade level. We have 30% one grade level below. You know, if you compare that to the national norm pre-COVID, that was 31%, 9% um, in the light red and 12% three grades below. So we're actually, you know, a little ahead of where we were, where the national norm was in winter 18, 19. Um, you can see where we compared Washington State. Again, West Valley School District looks pretty good compared to the state. So this is reading. Then we look at reading in a different way here. And this can show you each grade level. Again, at the bottom, the historical national norms. Remember that's the 2018-2019 school year. And then YTD is national year to date. That's how everybody in the nation that takes the iReady um, compares to us where it says you, our school district. So we can see each grade level where we compare um, with our target being getting back to that national norm or beating it. Um, and in some grade levels, we're doing fabulous. Um, but for the most part, we are in grades K through five ahead of the game in reading. And then here's six, seven, and eight for reading in those same levels. You can see an eighth grade, seventh grade, not so much sixth grade, but in seventh grade and eighth grade, we're like right there or ahead of where we were before the pandemic. So that's pretty encouraging. Um, you know, in less than two years time, we've caught back up. And here's mathematics. So how does, does our district play, compare relative placements compared to the benchmarks? If we look at Washington State there on the far right, you know, we're, we're ahead of the state. We're right where we want to be. We're right in line with where we were compared to the national norms in the 2018-2019 school year. And then here's grade level in mathematics. K-5. We've got some good comparison scores getting in, you know, in third grade, getting close to the national norm pre-pandemic. In fifth grade, close. And here we are in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So we look at the national year to date in eighth grade mathematics, 34% are in the dark red and 12% is in the light red compared to West Valley School District at 23% and 11%. We want those percentages obviously in those two and three grade levels below to be small. We wanna push our kids up into the yellow and the green. So this next section is all about Growth, which to me is way more interesting than where our kids level because the student growth um, goals are set by iReady based on how did students enter. So we always want to look at growth because if we have students who are entering below grade level, we want to try to catch them up. If we have students who are, at, who, who are starting the school year at or above grade level, we want them to continue to make one year's growth in one year's time regardless of where they start. And sometimes when teachers get hung up in those colors and principals and superintendents, sometimes the green, the yellow, and the red, they forget to look at, are those kids that enter on grade level or above still making more than one year's growth in one year's time? So to me, student growth is really exciting. So that dashed line there that goes across horizontally that's a 67% median growth. That means if we took all the students um, in the nation and lined up their growth percentage, I ready assigns a score student based on how they entered. So let's say you enter at 397 points in your fall diagnostic. 
iReady might say, okay, we want this student to gain 22 points by the end of the year. So this is measuring how close the students are to reaching that one year goal. So when we line up all those percentiles of how far each student in the nation, how close they are to reaching that one year goal, 67% is the middle number. So then we say, well, where is West Valley? If we look at kindergarten, the orange bar is where we are on our one year annual typical growth goal. The median number is 28%. We would expect it to be at 67%. So something's going on there with kindergarten growth. The blue bar or green bar um, is the stretch goal. So that's above and beyond the annual typical growth. I already assigns a goal um, to each student that's called their stretch goal. And that you can see how far we are there. But that dash line is just the median national number for percentage for um, that annual typical growth. So you can see in first grade, we got kind of close, but then you can see second grade, third grade, all the way through, look at seventh grade. <laughs> so the national median number is 67%. And what Valley's seventh grade, the median, the middle number is 124%. And if I were to show you seventh grade reading scores, the kids at the top, it would show you that even in winter, they've already made over 300% one year goal. So we're not even at the end of the year. And there's some students who have had tremendous growth. So that is super exciting. We're not sure what happened in kinder and first grade. We do know that our first graders came in looking at the fall diagnostic. They came in quite lower than they ever have before. That could be a COVID. That could be the number of students who were quarantined in those, um, those young grades. Um, you have to remember that this year, even though it feels like we're getting better and we're excited about getting to take off masks soon, we're still looking at data from students who were quarantined or um, had teachers who were quarantined, who had, you know, were in classrooms where kids couldn't be within six feet of each other, weren't allowed to do all of those strategies that we know produces good readers and mathematicians like you know, partner talk and table talk and student discords. All of that was adopted at the beginning of the year and we're looking forward to getting all those strategies back. But look at how West Valley is doing in reading um, despite those challenges. It's pretty exciting. So here's reading again. We of course wanna be in high performance, high growth. So those little dots show you um, the grade levels, K through eighth grade. First grade's right on the edge there. Kindergarten is high performance, low growth. Clearly, again, we've, we've gotta work on that. What's going on and why did we have low growth? We have a couple of ideas. Um, eighth grade, low performance, but high growth. If we continue to have high growth, we'll move over to the other side and have high performance, high growth. So this is very encouraging. And this shows you that same chart by school. So you can see the mid-level campus in reading right there on the border, just a couple of points away from high performance, high growth. That is so encouraging. Um, the rest of the schools, except for the West Valley Innovation Center, um, are just huddled right around the middle. Now we look at mathematics that same way. Again, we're looking at student growth. That line for math across the middle is 60%. That's the national median. So where did West Valley, where is our median per grade level? for one year's growth, for annual typical goal, how far are those kids, how close are they to meeting that goal in winter, halfway through the school year? Um, in kindergarten, we're at 41%, in first grade, 62%. Second and third grade, we're just almost right there at the national um, meeting. Same with fourth grade, 
Then we kind of start a shoot above and look at eighth grade mathematics. When we, um, when I had the call with the iReady folks, they were astounded by eighth grade math. They said they're not seeing that at all in any of their data discussions. And she said, you've got to tell us what's going on with eighth grade math. We were so excited to see this data. Those teachers are working hard and the kids are working hard and it's paying off. They're having huge growth. And here we are with grade levels. Again, looking, we really wanna be in that upper right quartile, high performance, high growth. Again, something's going on with kinder. We changed up a little bit the way we did our winter assessment compared to the way we did the fall assessment with kindergartners and that could have contributed um, to some of these abnormalities in our data, but the rest of them are just right there around the middle, except for eighth grade math, there it is. And here it is by school. So again, mid-level campus, low performance, high growth, but it's just working that way over. So this slide just shows another um, online personalized learning program that we use, which is Imagine Learning. When we started in our district, it was really just for students who are English language learners. And because of the difference, um, the different platform and um, just the different sort of data that you can get from it, two of our elementary schools decided to use some of their building funds um, to purchase this online platform for higher school. So it's not easy to compare it because it just depends on if the school, like what the N is, right? Like we have some schools where there was only 10 school kids on this um, platform and their um, diagnostic and what the information it gives us is quite limited compared to iReady. But I just wanted you to see that, you know, it, that data looks pretty good, K through two, three, and then we start to see a little issue in fourth grade and, and more students in the red, um, two grade levels below in fifth grade. It's basically impossible on this platform for kinders and first grades to score two plus low. It just, the diagnostic just can't go that low. Uh, it's more possible when you get to fifth grade. So we analyze this data as well. And then this last si slide is just an example of how we analyze the data this school year. We really wanna look at, have each school principal with their instructional coach, look at their student data and decide, here's what is the best. So this is a form that's called commonly, here's what, so what, now what? You know, like, here's what the data says. So what, why do we think it's happening? Um, and then now what, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna change as a result of this data? So it's important to analyze what's good, what's the best. If we don't really look at our data and we often don't do that, we often look at the data and go, oh no, what are we gonna do about this group of students that's not performing like we wish they would or like we expected them to, um, but what's, Equally important is what's going really well and why do we think that is so we can continue those strategies. So this is just Apple Valley's example of how they analyzed um, their winter data. And so they have four strategies, next steps to continue what's going fabulous and to correct maybe um, some places where there's gap in the data. Every school did its did a, um, a form like this for fall, and we did it for winter as well, and we'll do it for spring. It's just a really good way to have a conversation, kind of a guided conversation between the principal and the coach when they're looking at the data. So that is all I have. Do you have any questions? Yes, Mr. Thornton. Sure, if I can get back there.
Okay. Okay, I don't know why that happened. There we go. Yes. Right. I took that slide out because it wasn't as pretty and colorful. <laughs> I can send it to you. It's very interesting. So I actually made a chart um, of like 1819, 1920, 2021, 22, you know, like the whole thing. So where we were winter and where we ended. And of course, no end in the 2020 school year. Um, but it's in middle level in reading and math. They are actually ahead of where they ended last year. So exciting. And elementary schools are right close up there. What's really interesting is to look at last school year. So that is the 2021 school year where we ended compared to where we ended in 2019, right? Pre-pandemic, you can, it's so obvious the impact of COVID and the restrictions and the quarantines and, you know, not being able to do the excellent teaching strategies because, you know, it, it wasn't safe. So on that form, which I can send you on that chart that I made, it's so interesting to see that right out there. Last year, we're closer, but it, there's an impact. But we're almost caught up. And like I said, last year, like middle level campus in reading and math is actually ahead of where they were at the end of last year. So they had a whole full school year. Now we've only had half of it and they've already beat. And I'm talking about growth, the number of students, the percentage of students who made their annual typical growth goal. That's what we want. You know, you, it's kind of simple to think, sure, all students make their annual typical growth. You can see even from iReady, it's, it, that's not true. They don't all make it for various reasons, um, but we want them to. And so we're looking at that. It's very interesting to look teacher by teacher and school by school and see, you know, some teachers just stand out and almost poke you in the eye, right? Their growth data is amazing. At halfway through the school year, they have all students but one. There's a teacher at a TANM. All of our students but one have already are already halfway to their annual growth goal. And most of them are over 100% of their annual growth goal. So then what's happening there? We need to go in that classroom. We need to do observations. We need to figure out what she's doing and try to replicate that. Oh no, that was developed by us. It's, it's an old school improvement <laughs> strategy. Here's what, um, so what, now what? Um, and so, yeah, I work with Geraldine and we just adapted that slide. Sure. So we, you know, we've been meeting over Zoom. We're looking forward to getting back together. Um, but we wait, you know, a, like a good two weeks after the window closes to give the principal and the instructional coach time to really dig through the data, come to their conclusions, kind of sit on it, think about what they want to share, and then fill out the form. And then when we meet um, together in our principal coaches meeting, which is four or five times a year, you know, the coaches meet every week um, as a PLC, but the principals join in certainly after the diagnostics. Um, to kind of hear one another's, here's what, now what, so what, like what did their data say? Why do they think that's happening? And what are they gonna do about it? And it's really helpful to hear, um, for example, vocabulary is commonly a um, lower end scoring 
component on iReady. Um, and so, you know, we kind of get through all the reasons why, and sometimes there's a bunch of excuses, <laughs> and then we get to, okay, but what are we going to do about it? So, for example, two weeks ago in that meeting, um, you know, the, we talked about possibly developing or adopting a, you know, district-wide vocabulary strategy, like we would all use the same format. You know, there's a format that's like four boxes where the students get the vocabulary word, they draw a picture of it, they say what it doesn't mean, they say what they think it means, and they use it in a sentence. Like, you know, having some kind of format like that that we all follow um, and seeing if that can boost our scores and, and get kids to have a firmer grasp on grade level vocabulary. Yes, Mark. So you're talking about like looking in our district column, the 9% and the 12%? No, the yellow band. Oh, the yellow band. Yeah, one grade below. Oh, okay. Well, it looks like there's no variance and we're all about the same place, but you have to remember that kids are moving up from them and they're jumping in that yellow. And then some of those yellow kids are jumping in the green. Um, it's also a common place um, for like, we don't, we worry about the students that are one grade level below, but those are the kids. Sometimes we refer to them as like the bubble scores, the bubble students, because it's just quick and easy interventions. It's a little extra time here. It's um, analyzing the data and finding out exactly which components and reading they're behind and using, you know, we call them tier two interventions, uh, maybe a push in from an intervention teacher or para um, to really hit those gaps in their learning. So it, it looks like a bigger band, um, but that's really achievable. We struggle with the, with the ones that are two grade levels below or even three. Those are you know, more complicated, especially as we get into the higher grades, because that could be years that that student was below grade level. And then we get into all kinds of issues of, you know, it's a couple little skills. It could be motivation. It could be self-esteem. Um, so, yeah. Sure. So iReady does have two components. They have the diagnostic, and many schools just use their diagnostic. We, as a district, use the diagnostic and their online learning. That's that self-paced, student-leveled um, online reading instruction that places them at a level and moves them through lessons based on whether um, they are successful in those lessons. So it's really is a personalized instruction is what iReady calls it. Imagine Learning is another um, vendor that has a similar product. Um, what we've found in, um, with Imagine Learning is it's a little more relevant for students. It's a little more game-like. Um, there's more components for teacher analysis. T students record themselves reading and teachers can go in, you know, during their plan time after school and listen to those recordings, which sometimes is really funny because especially the younger ones don't realize that it's being recorded and they're making cat sounds during their story. So 
So that's always fun to play that back for them and say you're supposed to be reading, but they can really hear those students reading, you know, at, at a time when they, they don't have to get to every student in that moment. And again, it's just more, um, our students feel like it's just more relevant. It's more modern. It's also more expensive, to be honest with you. Um, it just has different research, maybe um, more newer research in how it was developed. The Imagine Learning Diagnostic, you saw how I could only show you one slide. It's just not as comprehensive. It doesn't, at this time, you know, compare, it won't let us compare to national norms or even state norms. It doesn't have that growth component that we think is really valuable um, and kind of as a measure. I mean, we look at these diagnostics measures as how are we doing and what do we need to change in what we're doing? And if the diagnostic and Imagine Learning um, doesn't line up for us, we're going to continue to use iReady. So we are looking forward to, this is why two schools, because the kids are excited about it. The stories are fresher. Um, the reward system is a little more, again, like a game platform compared to the iReady reward system. And, you know, frankly, some of our, many of our sixth, seventh and eighth graders are kind of tired of the iReady platform. They've been doing it for a very, very long time. Um, and I already admitted to me in a call that they don't have a lot of options at the upper end. So we've got highly capable students at fourth and fifth grade who are, you know, stuck at eighth grade <laughs> and they're getting the same stories again and again on that diagnostic. And that's not very motivating. So we are looking, looking at possibly shifting the whole district um, to imagine learning as our platform for personalized instruction which happens in a station rotation model in our classrooms where teacher would have a small group of students. There's a group over here that's working on a project, a group project. And then you've got a group of students over here that have their Chromebooks open and they're working on their reading um, platform. So, you know, I recently spoke to the Imagine Learning people because they were asking me why we like the iReady diagnostic better. And I had a whole lot of answers. So maybe eventually Imagine Learning will get caught up, but they've really spent their time in the platform of teaching kids to read and to be more fluent readers. And now they're just now trying to improve their diagnostic. Imagine Learning has focused more on the product, the online learning for students. They have really invested a lot of time and money into making that attractive to students and, and improving the student engagement and measuring their own success. They're commonly telling us, look at this rock star you have in West Valley that moved all of these levels. You know, they can show us because she put so many hours in iReady has spent more time in the diagnostic and not so much time in the however many years they've been in operation, I would guess eight or 10, they've spent more time developing an, an diagnostic tool that frankly aligns really well with our state assessment, with the Smarter Balance Assessment. So until, um, until Imagine Learning gets caught up and gives us the data that we need, we could have both products. Yes, that, that is not a report that's available. It's not something that iReady does. We probably could hand pick through it. Um, there was this big interruption <laughs> during the pandemic called remote learning. So uh, the tricky part of that was that many of the students took their diagnostic at home, which sometimes didn't lead to results that we would expect for various reasons. So. I'm not sure we could, um, you know, maybe we could do something like that from like last year moving forward, but having that interruption with remote learning. Mm-hmm. 
feel. They are absolutely fuzzy where maybe they were the way where they said. Right. Right now we can see that, but it's really just counting the same students that took it in the fall compared to the same students in the winter and the same, same students in the spring. It doesn't compare students year to year to year. That would have to be hand tooled. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm like, a, just wait, I'm like a little ahead. <laughs> so I pushed too many. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. I'll have to follow up on that. The first time I got this slide, it didn't have any school names on it. So it was not very helpful to me. So I had to request that the school names were on it. Um, so yeah, I can follow up on that. I didn't notice that they weren't there. That's interesting. Um, for the most part, yes. Um, it's very clear when you look at those classrooms that there's students that are um, just growing despite. So some of those classrooms when I those were like at mid-year where we would expect them to be at 50% in their growth, annual growth goal. Some of those kids were in the 200 and 300%. But then there's a few that, are, that were not making growth very similar to um, highly capable students that stayed in their neighborhood school. And that's why the student growth report is so helpful to look at because we can say, uh oh, when you just look at the colors, you don't see that. You're like, oh, great. I did have 20 students in the green and now I've got 26, yay, out of 29. But what about those students who started in the green and are right where they started? Like what's going on there? And that, you know, oftentimes is a telltale sign of um, not teaching small groups, not teaching to students levels, not personalizing instruction. And that's something that we're working on as a district. And so looking at those class by class and student by student um, is important. You have to remember too, that the iReady diagnostic is a snapshot. It's just one piece of data. So sometimes we get, met, we get information back from a student and we say, what? How is that student, you know, was at this level in fall and has dropped in winter? Sometimes with permission from the principal, a teacher can retest a student and sometimes it comes out fine. Sometimes it's just something with the student, especially we're talking about younger students sitting in front of a screen to take an assessment. Um, sometimes it's just an anomaly and we have other pieces of data that show the student is making growth. I can't answer that specifically, but you are right. There are some students that have topped out on the iReady um, and they still take the diagnostic, but it doesn't show growth because they're already pretty high. We do say that when they've gotten to that top of the eighth grade, they don't need to use iReady anymore for personalized learning for the instruction because they'll just get the same stories again and again. Um, but I'm sure there's measures that those teachers are using. I just don't know what they are. Yes, Steve.
So every school has supplementary materials that they use for interventions. Um, commonly those align, but sometimes there's, because we really try to tailor it to the student or the groups of students. Um, the two schools that are using the different plat line or um, platform for um, online instruction in, in reading specifically um, are Atanum and Summit View. So they're using Imagine Learning for their personalized learning online reading, where the rest of the schools are using iReady for those um, scores. And we really haven't had a full year to say whether their growth is higher. There's so many other things that play into a student growth. Like we just can't forget teacher impact, <laughs> teacher learning, teacher directed small groups. Um, it would be almost impossible to ferret out and say, well, these two schools are doing better because of Imagine Learning. What's more important is look at the message, um, like how many minutes are those students online in that program, um, and just to get student voice to ask them. Because if we see that there's more, um, which is the case right now at Summit View and at Tanum halfway through the year, the amount of minutes, the average number of minutes that those students spend in that online instruction, um, is greater than the other schools. That tells us that those students are enjoying those lessons. And then you just ask them. Some of the students that have exited out of the ELL program um, have said, why don't I get to do Imagine Learning anymore? How did I, how come I had to go back to iReady? It's because they really enjoyed it and they were challenged by it. Yes. So most of our schools have turned in um, their testing dates and they're like start in the second week of May. So it's like second, third, fourth week of May. Um, the data usually comes back, like now it's pretty quick. It's like a week, two weeks. But you know, you've always got those students that lag and they're not gonna release all the data. If you have a student who has an accommodation to take the online, the paper pencil test, we have to wait for that. It's not like it used to be where we take the test in, May, and then we had to wait till August. It's pretty quick. We get it before the end of the school year. We still haven't gotten the parent reports from our fall testing, which was really spring of 2021, but remember we took it in the fall. So there's a lag. OSPI is changing their, their score um, website and where we access scores. So things are quite, moving quite slow in that area, but it, promising mid mid March they'll have the parent reports out which again remember we cannot compare what the students did this last fall with previous years because it was a different modified test and we had a pandemic <laughs> any other questions Well, math has been a target for this district for many years. Um, math, the math I ready online component, we do have a requirement um, of students doing 45 minutes a week on that platform where we don't really for reading, encouraging teachers to use it. So there's that effort. Um, it's not true that all students have lower math scores than reading scores. It's often the opposite, especially for students who are multilingual. They can they can get the math, but the reading takes a little longer. So it's well, interesting West, to look at that. And West Valley scores uh, in the past were much higher in math if you looked at comparison to other districts. Uh, we have invested quite a bit into professional development with first steps in math, which fits in nicely with the station rotation because those are first step in math activities they can do in the learning stations. Um, when you look at pre-service, so preparation to be a teacher, there's quite a bit of focus on reading and not as much focus on math, I and mean, that's just the way it is. And so as teachers come into our system, in the past, we've been able to really beef up their understanding of math instruction by doing the first steps of math training. 
Uh, that's a series of trainings. There's a foundational training, first steps number and first step fractions. Um, as we have had uh, more teachers hired by the district in, in this recent year, um, we'll be looking to do first steps in math in the future as part of our professional development. We've kind of had a lot of professional development on hold right now during the pandemic. Uh, and certainly the first steps, I mean, I think it'd just be so difficult to try to do that training on Zoom. So um, we'll be looking in the future to, to beef up and, and to have teachers that have not had the first steps training will provide that professional development. But that's gonna be a long range plan that we'll work on. Um, it was really interesting, the hiring for West Valley. Um, last school year, we had hardly any new hires. And then this year we had just a, a, a large number of new hires to West Valley. And so we'll, um, we'll need to provide that first steps in math training in the future. All right, we do have another activity here during the study session. We're gonna uh, have uh, the random uh, selection of members of the instruction committee. So we have that as well. So if we're done with the study, uh, the, the uh, data summit, really appreciate Stacy pulling it together. It was nice to hear a different presenter than Peter Finch. So Stacy, thank you so much. And we appreciate your work with the principals and the instructional coaches and, and um, the um, we'll, we'll get an example. We had that uh, Apple Valley of the um, the planning on the here, here, here's what so what now what something like that. So we'll uh, we'll make sure we, we share those with the board as well with all of our schools uh, and their planning. So let's go ahead and have the board come on up here, and then we're going to have um, move to the next section. That'll be this random selection of instructional materials committee. We have uh, we'll get. Um, a selection of two community members, and then one parent for elementary, one parent for mid-level, and one parent for high school. So we have the names that uh, people did their interest in serving on the Instructional Materials Committee. There'll be the meeting in May. I believe it's set for May 11th. And that's where we'll look at um, this year's adoption, which is science materials. And so uh, the committee members will we, we have committee as well um, already established with uh, teachers and um, some of the committee members that said that they would like to continue serving. So we have the new members here. We'll have two, com two community and then there'll be three parents, one from elementary, one mid-level high school. So why don't we, we'll have the president do the drawing here. Why don't you hold the microphone? Uh, we also did uh, half court shots before every game, and I hate to say he made the most out of anybody, and I owe him his cards. So I think I put it all around. No, thanks, So good job. Um, Thank you. So, are we picking up from the gym? All right, there, there we go. <laughs> Very good. All right, here we go. So Mark's going to do the drawing. Uh, slips of paper, so draw two, what you can draw one at a time. So first name is Luis Lopez, community member. Second person, Alfredo R. Cisneros. And then now we have, this. next we have an elementary parent. Elementary parent. Testing, testing. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, one, two, three. I'll try to hear me. Can anyone not hear me if I talk this loud? No. All right. Megan Summers, parent. Next is mid level. Thank you.
Next is Mawina Tambanillo. Okay. Hope I didn't massacre that name too bad. And high school, Heather Harrison. Thank you. For all of those who volunteered, maybe weren't selected, but thank you for your interest. Items arising, anything, items arising? If not, we'll have a short recess until we resume to the board meeting. Thank you. Can you check um, batteries on these? There we go. This one's working again. So I'll just review this for everyone. We had community member Luis Lopez, community member Alfredo Cisneros, parent from elementary Megan Summers. Parent from middle level is Wina Tambanillo, and parent from high school, Heather Harrison. Testing.
Testing. It could be Friday or it could be Saturday or it could be this coming Tuesday. Hello. Hello. Testing, testing. There we go. We're on. Guys, it's working. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started with the regular meeting at 8 p.m. Call the meeting uh, again at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, March 8th. Um, we have already done the pledges, Pledge of Allegiance. We're going to go to changes to the agenda. But before I do that, just a quick reminder to everyone. I know we're all tired of wearing our masks, but please, we're still required to wear the mask through the is it the 21st or the 12th? Or the 12th? It'll 12th. be to the 12th. Just this weekend, yeah. So thank you for honoring that. I appreciate it. Just a little bit longer and we'll be through with this hopefully for a while or forever maybe. All right, uh, so moving on to item number three on the agenda there, changes to the agenda, Dr. Finch. Yeah, so just have one additional travel request. So we'll add that um, under approval of travel request. This will be number nine. And this will be for our... Um, DECA student who just was recently at the state competition qualified to go to the national competition. So Robinson's the advisor for DECA and we'll have the student and we'll have a chaperone and they will be traveling to Atlanta for the national competition. That's great news. Thank you, Dr. Finch. Uh, moving on to communications. All right, well, we received communication. So Jesse Goldbeck, come on down. We received communication from National Board Professional Teaching Standards that Jesse Goldbeck has uh, gone through the whole process to uh, reauthorize or recertify as a National Board Certified Teacher. So I believe it's, how many years, Jesse, is it good for now? 10, Ten right. So. Yeah, we need to so come on, come on down. So Jesse Goldbeck is the instructional coach at Mountain View. We thought this would work really well to have the evening that we have the Mountain View presentation. Looks like uh, we want to have a handshake. <laughs> All right, and oh, one more here. You go. So I was reading up on national board certification. In West Valley, we offer that. It's um, a two-year cohort to get initially certified. Uh, nationally, there is only 3% of teachers across the nation that are nationally board certified. Uh, we have quite a few in West Valley. Um, during the pandemic, our cohort has been pretty small. We're hoping that we can increase the cohort um, coming up in the next coming school year. We have, uh, as you're brand new to the district, you have a two years of a mentor program, and then two years of our instructional framework, we call it the TPEP, it's the teacher principal evaluation process. And then after that, you're offered that two year uh, cohort to get nationally board certified. So we have um, some gifts here for Jesse. So why don't you go ahead and open and show what we have in appreciation of your hard work to get certified as a national board certified teacher. There we go, a license plate frame. There we go. And got some more swag in there for you. Yeah, National Board Certified Teacher. So let's give Jesse a hand. Congratulations, Jesse. Anyone want to say any words here? What about after? Want Jesse to say something? All right, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a long road and it was um, 
really a challenge, but a growing um, experience and renewing was another growing experience. So thank you. Well, I appreciate our teachers going through that process of self-reflection. Congratulations, Jesse. It was great to be able to uh, highlight the best of the best. So really great that grateful that we were gonna take that time today and, and uh, recognize Jesse Goldbeck for her national board teacher certification. Okay, thank you again, uh, Jesse and Dr. Finch. We'll go ahead and move on to item number six. Well, I'm sorry, number five, school presentation, Mountain View. All right, so Debbie Cameron, principal of Mountain View is gonna do a presentation. She does have a PowerPoint, so we'll ask the board to go ahead and join the audience so we can see the PowerPoint. Do that. Is this on? Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good evening. <laughs> it's nice to be here. I'm Debbie Cameron. For those of you who don't know me, principal of Mountain View, and this is Stacy Devet. She's the counselor at Mountain View, and she will be doing the presentation this evening. Um, and our our presentation tonight it's on social emotional learning, and we're looking specifically at how we're using the SEL standards from Washington State and focusing on moving away from a reactive intervention with just specific students to creating more a program that is proactive and universal to positively impact all of our students. So second slide. So why social emotional learning? And I, I think that's an easier question for all of us at this point. Um, we've see, seen a huge increase in depression and stress and anxiety in our students. And I think um, this is just one study, but there are multiple studies that we can take a look at. Um, in addition, um, this kind of learning also improves student attitudes towards school. And we also see an increase in pro-social behaviors like kindness, sharing, and empathy. And that's something that we're taking a look at at Mountain View. We've done a behavior screener in the fall, and we're getting ready to do our second behavior screener um, at the end of March. We're also looking at some other data that we're compiling to put together for some of that work as well. And then, of course, improves achievement, uh, academic achievement, and that's, that's always a, a very big one. So asked our students, um, just recently, we asked our uh, third graders through our fifth graders, and we said, what do you love about Mountain View and, and why? And hands down, um, and it uh, almost emotional tone in my voice, but hands down, teachers and staff. And when asked why, there were so many responses that revolved kindness and safety and no bullying, and it's like a big family. And to quote one of our students, a fifth grader said, the overall standard at Mountain View is to build a structure, the rules are fair, and they help with bullying and safety. It's a words from one of our students. So while Stacy's presenting tonight, um, we're presenting, she's presenting on behalf of Mountain View staff. And I think we wanna point out our teachers and our staff tonight, especially. I know we both talked about that. Um, without them, there's no implement, implementation, right? They, they are the force behind that. And so we just wanna give a huge shout out for the support that we've had in, in the implementation of our curriculum, our second step and Superflex the consistent language and expectations that they've used with pride behavior from PBIS and also their participation. And we have a strong participation um, from our Mountain View staff in our care team in our tier, for our tier two and tier three interventions. So with that being said, I'm gonna introduce Stacy. She is our board certified behavior analyst. 
Um, she is going to talk a little bit about the creation of the hub. She's also going to share some data on internal and external behaviors and our tiered interventions and proactive supports that are in place that we are using to support our students. Thank you. All right, good evening. Hello, my name is Stacy DeVette and this is my second year as the school counselor at Mountain View. Prior to becoming a counselor, I was an elementary teacher. I've taught many grade levels and specialist classes in traditional brick and mortar schools, as well as the lead teacher in an alternative learning program for the CELA School District. CELA HomeLink is an alternative learning program creating off-campus non-virtual remote learning for homeschool families. When I first started in this program, I was dealing with mainly traditional homeschool families looking for academic support with their home, home programs. Over the years, there was a shift in the program and I was seeing more kids leaving the traditional brick and mortar schools for behavior reasons and searching for places to belong. I could see the need for behavior programs in schools and started to research how I could get involved. My research led me to take classes in applied behavior analysis, which eventually led to my certification as a board certified behavior analyst last November. Years ago, I saw a news program uh, about a, a Ridgeview Elementary here in Yakima that dedicated a classroom specifically for emotional support for their students. The room created a safe place for students to come, calm down, de-escalate, and get back to class. The wheels started turning for me at this point, and I knew one day I wanted a room just like that to support my social emotional program. I pitched my dream of a calm down room to Ms. Cameron last summer, and she didn't hesitate to help me find the space and resources I need to fill this dream. Honestly, I had no idea how my vision in my head of what this room would be like would actually look like today. I am ecstatic to say that the room has been more of a success than I could ever have dreamed of. Out of the vision came the hub. The hub stands for helping us be our best. It's a safe place for anyone to use throughout the school day to come self-assess, calm down, and get reset before heading back to class. Anxiety, sadness, strong emotions, and other uncomfortable feelings can happen anytime during the school day, before or after, recess, lunch, and we need a place for our students to be able to go. I teach our students that if you're having one of these strong emotions, then you need to calm down because right now, your amygdala in your brain is blocking your prefrontal cortex from helping you learn and make good decisions. The hub is a pot quiet place to come, check in with your feelings and emotions, do some calm down activities and reset your body to get you back to class as quickly as possible. Five minutes spent in the hub getting you reset and your brain prepared for learning is a small amount of time out of the classroom to help us be our best self. I know what the hub means to me, but I wanted to know what it meant to our students. So one day at recess, I went around and asked them to explain to me what the hub was to them in a few words. And these are what some of the kids said. They said it was a relaxing place. It was a safe zone. It was warm, calming, understanding, a hug, live, a happy place, imaginary place, helpful, a dream, and welcoming, which I do with, with more of, of all of this is what the hub is to me as well. When you come into the hub, you um, were using the zones of regulation curriculum, and you choose one of the zones that you're feeling, where you're blue, where you're kind of sad, um, yellow, where you might be, you know, overwhelmed, frustrated, red, those are pretty strong emotions, you're feeling angry and um, I'm very upset. And then green is typically where we want to be. So I don't see a lot of kids in the green zone when they enter the hub. Um, but they pick their zone and their emoji on how they're feeling. And this is all without my help. They know exactly how to do it. They just walk in, do their check in. And then they go and they find the corresponding box that goes with the color of their zone. Inside one of those boxes, there is um, a, a strip that gives you a de-escalation uh, calm down technique, like maybe it's a breathing activity or a counting activity. Um, and then there's also a suggestion on whatever activity you could do after that. There's also a five minute timer, which I want you to start right away as soon as you find a quiet spot in the room. Because again, we want you to be in and out as quick as possible and not missing a lot of school, uh, a lot of class. So if you don't like whatever strategy I have on that strip, it's completely fine. It's open to you. You can use one of the fidget toys. We have a balance board. 
sampling. Um, that's a sequin board up there that you can draw on, or you can just chill out on the bean bags, sit under the weighted blankets, whatever you think that you need for your five minutes of time in the hub. When your five minutes are up, this is when you go back to your zones and you can, um, some kids move zones, they might change from, from uh, yellow to blue and sometimes they don't change. And then you would check out with either myself or Mrs. Esperson who helps me in the hub because there is always somebody in the hub at all times. Um, and we, this is when probably one of the first times that we actually talk to you after you've calmed down, we ask you some questions. How are you doing? Do you feel like you can go back to class? Most of the time, yes, the kids are in and out in five minutes, but there's some times where we're in that red zone and we just might need another five minutes. And so we might suggest, why don't we start another round? And so then they'd go and they'd find another box and start all over again. Um, like Mrs. Cameron talked about, we do do the screener. Um, we do it at uh, fall conferences and then again at spring conferences. And we use the data that we get from the behavior screener to look at internalizing behaviors. And those are the ones that are um, probably not as noticeable as the externalizing. They're, you know, the sad, withdrawn, pure rejection, things like that. And um, I use this information to help create small groups and programs within the school. And we also use it when um, we have our care team and PBIS meetings. Some of the small group programs I have um, created specifically for internalizing students is every Friday I do um, group in the gym and it's um, from nine to 9.30. And so it's, I leave it open to the teachers on this one because you never know, someone might just be having a rough week or a rough morning and, and they need to come in and do some yoga and kind of help them get through it. We also have an afternoon art club, which we focus on social, social emotional art. Um, and I invite all of the internalizing students to that art club, as well as I open it up to third to fifth grade, because I like to bring in other students as well to kind of model relationship building. We have a lot of great discussions while doing art and having a great time. I recently just started um, a book club with our fifth grade students for reading uh, Because of Mr. Terrup which is a great book that follows seven fifth graders through their entire school year. And it talks about relationships and problems that they have within their class and with their teacher and with each other. And it's a great way for us to talk about fictional characters and how they solve their problems. And hopefully um, the students will be able to apply that to their own, own self and their own. Um, Um, our externalizing behaviors, these are the ones that are more in your face, you see on a day-to-day -day basis, aggression and things like that. Um, again, we use this information to help in our PBIS care teams and for me to create some small groups. And some of the, the clubs that I have created to help with some of those externalizing behaviors is I started a club, which stands for Respectful Energetic Club Encouraging Sportsmanship and Safety. And this is a small group of about six to eight students that come into the gym and we play small group games, which is a great time for us to really overemphasize following directions, following the rules, um, not playing so competitively. We can stop the game if we have conflict and talk about strategies that we can use to solve the conflict before they escalate and, and, um, and go from there. I also have a small group of zones of regulation that I um, do with a small group of students. And we work on a lot of de-escalation issues in and outside of the classroom. Our tier one program, which is in throughout our, all of our classes, um, I go into every class for 30 minutes a week. And I do a kind of a mixture of different programs and I kind of mix them all up every week. So Superflex, which is a great program. It's about a superhero and his name is Superflex. And he lives in your brain, which is also known as Social Town. And in Social Town, you have these unthinkable characters that are trying to overtake Social Town and Superflex. And they use the vocabulary expected and unexpected behavior. And if you are having an unthinkable moment, then you're doing something that is unexpected for the situation. All of the students start out becoming social detectives. They are all certified social detectives. They use their tools, their eyes, ears, and their brains to help them figure out what is an expected or expected behavior for that situation because they change. Um, it's expected outside that you can run in the classroom to be an unexpected behavior. So I teach them to use their social skills, sorry, their social detective tools, <clears throat> excuse me, to help them figure out what's expected and unexpected. And then Superflex 
helps you by giving you strategies if one of these unthinkables is trying to overtake your social talent or your brain. Um, we intermix that conversation a lot with mind up and how your brain works. I focus on three parts of your brain, the amygdala, um, which is your security guard, your prefrontal cortex, which helps you make good decisions and focus and pay attention, and your hippocampus. This is basically your file cabinet where you keep all the information that you're learning. When one of your unthinkables, let's take Glassman, for example, it's this guy right up here. When he tries to overtake social town, he's gonna make you have a really big reaction to a small problem, which we know big reactions come from when our amygdala is going crazy. And when your amygdala is going crazy, he puts up stop signs all around and you're not allowed to, you're not to use your prefrontal cortex, which helps you focus, pay attention and make good decisions. So Superflex gives you some strategies Hey, let's do some positive self-talk. Let's do some breathing. Let's walk away from the situation to get your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex working together again and calm your body down. So when unthinkables come up, um, Superflex is there to give you some things to help you use. We also use the second step program. And again, I intermix a lot of Superflex and mind up with uh, so second step. We talk about problem solving, social or students learning skills, um, empathy, and we're doing a bully prevention unit right now. Um, but I just kind of mix it all up and try and keep it as entertaining and exciting as possible. The kindergartners, I like to do Kelso's Choice with. Um, it's a frog. He's very entertaining. It's a puppet. And he goes in there and he teaches through stories and puppet uh, plays and stuff, teaches about small problems versus big problems and the different choices that you can make to help you solve those small problems and big problems. I do a daily check-in, check-out with about nine students. Um, all of their check-in, check-out forms are, are unique and individualized to them. Some are on a traditional points-based system, and some like to start out with, with all their points at the, at the day, and they might lose some of their points if they're doing something that's unexpected. So um, that's why there's so many different ones up here. Their goals are all different, and... They come in and they check in with me. Some of them I might do a small social skills story with if I know that maybe they have a sub for the day or there's going to be a, a fire drill or something that might trigger some of their some of their behaviors. I might start them out with a social story. Um, and then they they all the teachers and parapros and specialists, they all know about their behavior check-in checkouts, and I give them updates about weekly on any changes and stuff like that. Um, they all work for some reward. Some of them are daily rewards. Some of them are weekly rewards. Some of them, I have one student that is working for um, a Nerf gun uh, war that is going to take place with students and teachers. So that's a, a, a bigger reward. So we're going to it's going to take him a little bit longer. Um, at the end of the day, they come back and they check out with me. We talk about the positives for the day. Even if they didn't get their points for the day, we just talk about what went well and how can we make that day look um, better tomorrow. Um, we have two students, three, sorry, three students that have graduated from the traditional um, behavior chart this year. And now they're just kind of working on whatever their teacher has within their classroom. And we have one student that Mrs. Cameron um, took a video of and kind of talk about how he's gone through the program. He started in the program last year and how he just graduated this week. So here we, oops, how do I go back? And we did get permission to share.
was being mean to me and I used to just hurt them and not just go to the hub and uh, talk about it to uh, with uh, Mrs. Devet or to people. But this year, uh, Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to summarize. So this student, we had interviewed several students for Counselors Appreciation Week. And we were asking them questions about the hub, and we were asking them different questions about um, how things, um, how they felt about their counselor, of course, as well. And this particular student, it was, it was so, it was such a beautiful moment. And I'm sorry that we didn't get that. Uh, we thought we had that. But basically, they shared about their last two years of experience at school and how he had used violence uh, or, you know, hitting other kids. Um, to when he was frustrated or he was angry and how that has really turned around this in, within the last, uh, this last year. And I think what really moved, obviously my summary is not going to do that, but I think watching his face as he really spoke about that change, I think that was what was so moving about um, how much that meant to him. And so um, that was basically it. And then on that point, I'll let you go ahead and finish. Thanks. I go back. How do I go back? Okay, um, so out at recess, and I mean pretty much anywhere in the school, we want to make sure that everyone's using the same vocabulary that I'm teaching in the social skills classes. We realize that the parapros and the specialists aren't there um, when I come in for the weekly classes. So at the beginning of the school year, um, we wanted to make sure that this was still happening outside at recess too. So we did a professional development, and we went over the different vocabulary, expected and unexpected behaviors, and I go through the problem solving steps program with students um, when they're working on a conflict with each other. And so we've made designated areas outside at recess that utilize the steps program for paras and recess teachers to encourage students to go and use and that they can come and moderate for them if they need someone to help them. We also um, have just recently started a stoplight program for a few of our classes that we're having some difficulty showing pride while lining up after recess. And um, the paras were spending lots of time um, missing their group times because they were talking to teachers about the different problems that they were having um, from their students lining up. So the stoplight program is pretty simple. If your class gets a green, which is right outside your door, and the paras can just move um, the sticky note to or the Velcro dot for the, the recess to either green or red, then your, your class was showing pride while they were lining up and um, following directions and staying in line. If you get a red and the students know what they get as they're walking in, they announce, oh, red light, and they explain to them what the red light was for, but it's usually about showing pride and not um, staying quiet and lining up appropriately. And there's just alleviated the amount of time that the pairs were spending going door to door, telling all the teachers about what their students were doing, lining up outside. If there's a, a concerning problem, then of course they'll email or go and find that teacher later on, but at least the teachers know right away when the students get into the class, okay, we need to talk about how you guys are lining up or, hey, let's celebrate. You guys did a great job and let's keep going with it. Um, we encourage adults to get out and play um, in all the games. And you can see there's a couple teachers out there playing, including Miss Cameron, a game of Gaga Ball. And it's just a great way for us to model how to be good sportsmen 
um, how to you know lose fairly and how to leave the game when when you're out of the game and it's um, the kids really enjoy it when we jump in and play they all gang up on us but it's all right. Um, but anyway, so they really enjoy it and we really encourage as, as, um, as much adult play as we can ball gaga ball whatever we can just so that we can model those good behaviors. During the pandemic, I created a virtual office to get um, resources and supports to the families that were at home. And this, we're still utilizing it um, this year. It's in most of the Google classrooms for the classes. And then it's also being sent home in my monthly newsletter. And um, we actually encourage the families to go on a virtual scavenger hunt this last winter and then fill out a Google form after they went through it. It has ways that you can get a hold of me, pretty much anything on here that you click on. Um, has resources that you can go to, but this one takes you directly to the website. And then if you want to click on this picture, it will take you to all of these are stories that are read to you and they follow um, Julia Cook's great for, you know, social stories and social emotional stuff. So if you're having a bad day, you might go and click on this one and listen to story at home about the worst day ever. Um, um, this one goes through a whole bunch of, there's different activities, different books that you can read. You can go watch videos on um, neurons and how uh, your mind works and growth mindset. So everything on this page is linked to the growth mindset. And then this page, just a whole bunch of calm down activities that you can do. There's a piano, there's glitter balls. You can just click on anything and it'll take you to whatever activity that is. Mind Yeti, there's a whole list of videos here that'll take you to all these videos that do yoga and Mind Yeti and just kind of get your, their quick little videos that you can do at home. And then this one is a video about Kelso and Kelso's choice. So there's tons of activities on here that families can go through. Each one of their classes has a different file cabinet that the parents can see what we're doing in the classroom, what second step lesson we are on, what we're we're talking about it's all listed here if they want to get resources at home um, and they don't know how to get a hold of me that's it's right here for them um, that's it thank you thank you stacy Testing. So Debbie, uh, we might have some questions from the board on the presentation. And uh, while you're coming down, just it's really gratifying to see the work that we've done. It was quite a few years ago, we had Diana Browning Wright come and we did a, a session with pr all principals, um, teacher leaders, and uh, members of the positive behavior intervention support teams from each of the schools. Uh, it was real learning for us on uh, the importance of all these different strategies that we heard from Stacy this evening, like the check in and check out, uh, doing an assessment, universal screen for externalizing behaviors and internalizing behaviors. The externalizing, we kind of we can see those as our kids acting out. The internalizing are oftentimes uh, overlooked in schools, and those are students that need assistance as well with the internalizing issues that they are needing assistance with, and so. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation to see how there's support for all students and then the tiered interventions. And you can see how that is working in action at Mountain View. So thank you so much for that presentation. Any questions for Debbie? Just, just like to know in a normal day, how many kids go into the timeout room, the calm down room, and, and how do you maintain staffing? Oh, great question. Can you repeat the last part? Uh, what was the hub, the hub room, about how many kids check into the hub room per day and, and how do you maintain staffing to the hub? Oh, okay. Um, so I would say, uh, thank you. Um, I would say about five 
students per day, anywhere, you know, anywhere from three to five. Um, and we have a lap paraprofessional that is um, stationed there as well as Stacy. So there are always two people. So if she needs to um, be out in classrooms or if something, there's always, always someone there. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Debbie. All right. Thank you. Great presentation. Yeah, great presentation. Let's give a hand. Okay. Thank you. Moving on here to item six, public comments of non-discussion agenda items. Do we have a sign-in sheet? Okay, again, we will allow uh, up to 30 minutes with five minutes per person max speaking. So um, I'll try to alternate to see if we have any online uh, or um, Zoom uh, callers that would like to participate. So we'll start with uh, Peter Marinacci. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to give a, a shout out to uh, Amy Forrest. Um, I was out on uh, business, the board meeting two weeks ago, and what a pleasure it is I can get back from my business. And if I want to see a recording of a board meeting, I can do that now. So a long time coming. I, I, don't, I saw her earlier. Thank you so much. Um, I think this is really important for a lot of folks who are working and you're just not available that you can see the board meeting and staying in what's going on with the school. Um, as a follow up to the last meeting, I want to expand on some of the comments from Ryan Matthews. Um, he had talked about um, how the last levy vote was really tight. It was 52% and it's not exactly a ringing endorsement of you know, support, which is a concern because obviously down the road, there's also going to be you know, a vote for potentially for more school construction. So my suggestion for the administration and the school board is why don't you go out and solicit uh, the views of people to try to ascertain maybe some of that negative sentiment. And there's an easy way to do it. You know, I'm in the business world. We actually go out there and we check out with our clients what's going well, what's not. We hire a third party firm. One thing that the school district could do as a low cost measure, and you've got Amy now, uh, you can do like Survey Monkey, and you can come up with a list of questions, and you can put in some comment, you know, a little dialogue box. And Amy, I'm willing to volunteer my time to help you with this. Um, another matter that was noted at the last board meeting, which I could not attend, um, the attachment was a response comment was about the diversity, inclusion, and equity comments related to the RAM Pride materials shared in January. And in my view, and I talked to a few other parents, the response was extremely weak. It didn't really address the core issues that were going on. Um, many of the folks, uh, such as myself, had done the due diligence. Uh, we understand what the purpose of that, you know, response to bullying, and none of us support any sort of bullying. I'm not aware of anyone who wants bullying to take place. Uh, the statement about the state of Washington denoting sex options is, has no bearing on what we're talking about here whatsoever. I don't even know why it was including there. So overall, it's just a weak uh, response. So apparently a restatement of what the concerns are is in order. So rather than providing students materials from a third parties that include statements that are extreme, could have been focused on the concept of respect. Rather than telling students that they're causing oppression or a form of violence as indicated in one of the articles, why not just simply share being respectful of others and decisions on how to be addressed could be addressed by those two individuals. Likewise, the inclusion of the animated video, including scientifically factually incorrect statements, it was effectively 
effectively disrespectful of those who hold an accurate view of sex is not something the school district should be promoting. Unlike one parent who spoke last week about maybe opting out of such teaching, my view of this material does not belong at all. Essentially, a school is endorsing this material. In the future, when such issues are being considered, in this case, the advisor knew it was problematic, the advisor or teacher should consult not only with the administration, but with a parent group. The district claims to be promoting inclusion in so many areas. It is not inclusion if a certain dogma is being presented, and if a student disagrees with this, they are in the wrong. Let me be clear, that's not inclusive. As stated in my original public sharing, if any of the administration, board members, any other parents out there want to talk to me and have a constructive discussion about this topic, I'm all ears. I want to be thoughtful about this. Otherwise, I have one simple big picture statement for the administration and the board. Keep out of the culture wars. Stop it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Marinacci. Uh, is there anybody via Zoom that uh, would like to make a comment? Okay, thank you. We'll go to the next person on the list. Um, Amanda Gasco. My son Brenton is in Mrs. Webster's classroom, a special ed containment classroom. Sorry, I'm gonna get upset. <laughs> Last week, I had to go to the classroom to give instructions on how to feed Brenton through his new G-tube, which is nothing new. As I was washing his tube out, I couldn't get any hot water, not even lukewarm. I asked the teachers who are so sweet and they're just happy to be in a classroom. Mind you, they were in portables with no running water. We talk about equity and inclusion. These teachers had to fight in order for these kids to be in, a, in the school, in the actual junior high. I said, does this water get hot? And they looked at me and said, no, we've had no hot, running hot water since the beginning of the school year. None. The parents said, a couple of the parents had said that they reached out to facilities and they told them that since the building was old, they, couldn't have, they, could, they weren't able to give them hot water. There's two sinks in that classroom. There's a bathroom in the classroom. And since the September of this year, there has been no running hot In the most recent levy that went out for vote, everyone was concerned about little Johnny wouldn't make it to his sporting events or maybe his choir practice. But what about the students who aren't able to do that sort of thing? For the record, I'm all for little Johnny and his extracurricular activities. I have another one at home. But let's not look, overlook the core needs of Western civilization. This is special education and there are diapers being changed. There are bodily fluids that are exposed to on a daily basis. And there's my son who has a feeding tube that needs hot soapy water in order for it to be clean. We had to contact the administration for this because the teachers and the parents couldn't get an answer. They couldn't, all they were told, but it was not possible because the building was too old. And mind you, the nurse Crystal was in there with me and she told me that she didn't have any hot water in her nurse's station for six years. And it took that to get an instant hot water heater put under her sink. My, my stepmom runs a daycare. She's a licensed daycare in the state of Washington and they come and inspect her home a lot. And you know, the first they check is they use a thermometer to check the warmth of her running hot water to make sure that it's above 120 degrees. 
Why is this not the case with the schools, especially with COVID? Our most vulnerable, medically fragile children, we put the masks on them, but we don't give them hot running water. You're just supposed to wash your hands with warm, hot, soapy water for 30 seconds. It shouldn't take me reaching out to administration for these teachers and these parents to be heard. Indoor, indoor plumbing has been a commonplace since the 1920s. So what do you say we do better? Because teachers have reached out and I have been in the special education system with my son for 14 years in the West Valley School District. And let me tell you, there's been some things that we've had to ask for that are pretty, pretty crazy, but to have hot running water to me is unacceptable. We've got two brand new, beautiful schools that are built that are beautiful. But we've got a special ed classroom with our most vulnerable children in them with no running hot water. And these parents and these teachers are exposed to, to bodily fluids and everything else every single day. There, ne there needs to be a level of accountability here. And to tell me that actually the response that I got last week was, well, we're, we're gonna fix it, but I have no timeline. And that was Dr. Reynolds. I will have no timeline. That is not acceptable. There needs to be a timeline. These kids are at risk for infection. COVID, right? These teachers are, are angels and these parents are what keep this school running. And if they're not being listened to and being heard for hot water, why, how do you expect them to stick around? Because these people add a lot of value to our children's lives, especially in the special needs education setting. Okay, these parents know a lot, are with our children more than we are during the week. And they know our kids. And I am devastated that they have had no hot water and nobody has been there to listen to them. And they told me we need the parents to reach out and say something because we have and nothing's been done. So I say we need to do better. Thank you. Thank you for your comment and also your making us aware. Uh, let's go on to Carol Blevins. Good evening. Hi. Um, I have two little granddaughters in the uh, primary school. And so um, I just want to go back again to the equity inclusion. Um, I was thankful for the, for the response last uh, meeting about that. But um, to me, it was presented like it was just kind of a one thing, one time deal in the high school. Well, I called um, a Tanum Elementary and talked to the principal there, Mr. Hartman, and he said, you know, that, yeah, they have that down in the elementary school. And so I'm assuming that that is in all grade levels, that it's a program in West Valley District. And so I'd like to request that um, we have a really nice presentation like we had tonight and last week. I mean, I'm, you guys, some of you guys are about my age and I, I don't really know what this looks like. I like to see the exercises they're doing in the different school <laughs> um, uh, grade levels and uh, what the goal is here exactly. And some of the videos that they're showing the kids, some of the exercises they're doing with the kids and just, you know, let us see what it's all about. So that's my, my request on this subject. Thank you. And, and thank you for your comment and again, more awareness. Uh, I'll stop here for just a moment and see if there's any more comments on Zoom that we need to listen to. There is one, okay, let's go ahead and that one. Oh, hi, I am sorry, I have the camera, but it's broken. So are you able to hear me? 
just barely. Okay. Are you able to hear me a little better now? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. I'm turning up my volume. Okay. Um, um, hi, my name is Julie Erickson. Um, I have two children, um, a West Valley High School student and a 2018 graduate. Um, I have been a very involved parent um, and both of my children have had a great experience growing up in the West Valley School District community. In fact, um, Peter Finch, Peter Marinacci and Mike Thorner, my um, children have been in musicals, choirs and cross country with your children. <laughs> so I know um, some of your kids. Um, I wanted to address um, the last levy that was um, addressed at the last school board meeting. Um, I was listening to the last board meeting in which a community member mentioned concern about the lack of support for this past school levy. Even though it passed, he said there were an additional six to 700 no votes and 900 fewer yes votes. He then said, there continues to be underlying issues that have to be resolved, that we must face them, understand them, and figure out how to resolve them or we are not going to have the success that our community and students need. And that as West Valley, we would be proud to support. Concerning these comments, a school board member, Mike Thorner said the school board will take these results and the comments he made about the results seriously. So I would like to suggest that the first place you start looking is it how West Valley School District continues to mishandle and make bad decisions with taxpayer money when it comes to special bonds that rebuild schools? When my family moved to West Valley in 2006, I heard a lot of dissatisfaction about the way the money was handled when building the new high school. Now, here we are 15 years later, the next big build project, and you are spending money on expensive Seattle attorneys to fight a city law that you broke when building one of the new elementary schools. The city of Yakima has asked you to abide by the law. The land use hearing examiner upheld the city's decision. And then the city council upheld the hearing examiner's decision that you abide by the law. Instead of admitting your mistake, and holding the contractors that you hired or whomever else accountable, you are now fighting it in court. Every time you do these things, you tear down community trust. Since my family has lived in this community for the past 16 years, I have voted yes on the school levies. This past levy, I could not bring myself to vote no, so I decided just not to vote at all. So you lost my vote. But I do know that many members of the community have changed the way they view West Valley School District because of this situation and will now not support West Valley School District in any way. When you do not exhibit basic characteristics like trustworthiness and accountability, characteristics that are taught to our children in your schools, you can only expect a lack of support from the community. The West Valley School District community expects and deserves transparency and honorability from the members they vote on to govern the district. If you want the community to support the schools, you have to be reliable and good stewards of our money and care about the community in its entirety. Whether they have kids going to the school district or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments and interest. Uh, do we have any more Zoom comments? Okay, we will go to the last uh, comment here by Tara. Uh, Tara here, okay. Tobia?
Yes, so my name is Tara Cobia, and I have uh, currently five kids in the district, one graduated um, in 2020. And I was just wanting to actually follow up um, with some a comment that I made back in the fall at a meeting in regards to the um, gender bathroom, gendered bathroom issues that we were having at the high school. And um, I just wanted to follow up with some research that I've been doing and wanted to let the board know that um, we are, I'm, will be coming with a proposal soon with um, what I hope will be accepted by the board to make some, some building changes to our bathroom such situation. Um, at the, and ultimately, really, it probably needs to happen at every building, but right now we're focusing on the high school. That seems to be where it's the most prevalent, where we have um, those who are biologically female identifying as male, those who are male biologically and identify as female and not having um, a place where they can safely use the restroom. And what we're, what I, I've talked with architectural firms and various um, school districts uh, across the country uh, in Oregon, in the Midwest who are doing this and are very are finding a lot of success in creating an all-inclusive bathroom space. And um, I've been able to get some numbers and some, they've looked at plans and I'm really hopeful that we've got a really good solution that will actually not just create a safe space for um, one group of students, but actually for all students, it creates a safe space for everyone. So I just wanted to let you know that that is not something that I've let die, that we've been working on it. I'm very hopeful. We've got some, uh, everything from floor plans to potential budgetary uh, interests and what it would potentially cost a high end. <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm hoping that we will have the support of the board that as we um, look at some where these where the funding can, will be to back up this project that I think is should be a very high priority on the list, that the funding can come from a variety of places, but the two places that I'm really hoping to pull it in from is one from our diversity, equity, and inclusion that we are really researching and amping up right now that that should hopefully go to support where we are trying to make this an all-inclusive space for everyone from the special needs child, the person who needs a caregiver in their restroom with them to him, her, they, it, it, this is a safe space for everyone. This, this is about as inclusive as it could be for every, every student um, and adult in the high school that comes to you. You know, our, our, our high school is used, <coughs> excuse me, um, by the community with sporting events and various things, and it would create a space that's safe for everyone. And then uh, the other area that I'm hoping that the board will consider is that as I, I know that with the, the bond monies that from our completed elementary schools, I know that there is a process for the remaining funds that um, are, are left over from the bond that was passed for our two elementary schools, that part of that funding will also go towards this. I know that everybody has their opinions on which things would take the top priority and which things should be given the most attention. And well, that I'm not alone in suggesting that this is should be a top priority, that this is one that is worth the time and the money and the ex to be able to create this space that is safe for all students. Thank you. Okay, again, thank you for your Thank everybody for their comments and being considerate of everyone and staying within the allotted time. So we really appreciate hearing all of your input. Uh, one last call for anyone online via Zoom. And if not, we'll go ahead and close the uh, public comment section. Moving on to item number seven on our agenda, uh, action items, Dr. Finch. Uh, start first with the approval of the minutes. Okay, um, need somebody to make a motion of the approval of the minutes. Well, it looks like we have the study session and regular meeting. Do we need to take those apart or can they be done together? I think they can be done together and I'll move that we approve them as such. Okay, we have a motion to approve the minutes for February 22nd study and regular study session and regular meeting. We'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, sign. Motion carries 5-0. Uh, uh, action item 7B, approval of travel requests. Is this 
So you have an additional one? Yes, this would include item nine. It'll be Tom Robinson, advisor for the DECA competition. And this is uh, will be held in Atlanta, Georgia. Departure date is April 22nd and return date is April 27th. I have a question about items six and eight in regarding the number of people that are sent to Alaska for a football game, eight, nine, and 10. And then the same people, well, the head coaches, to a coaches conference in Pennsylvania that lasts a week, the week before spring break. Yes, actually. I'm interested in the cost and why we're sending that many people. Right, I, I had looked into this. Um, for the trip to, uh, they're actually providing West Valley with funds. Um, as um, I was pleasantly surprised to hear that. So the, the school in Alaska is providing funds for the, the football team to travel to Alaska and play that game in September. And then um, just the coaches clinic in Pennsylvania, that's, uh, just their regular budgeted funds that they have. So they've set aside funds to be able to provide that uh, opportunity for our coaches to have the clinic at Penn State. Mr. Meyer, uh, do you want to discuss that any further or do you want to move forward with that or pull it out? Um, I'd still be interested in the cost. And I think, you know, we have enough time to address that. And we could move it to our next regular meeting and vote on those two at that point. I don't, well, with what uh, Dr. Finch just said about the Alaska trip, I don't think there's any further discussion on that. But the three coaches going to Penn State for a week, the week before spring break, I don't. I don't know that we need to send all three of them. It looks like it's 850 per per, per the travel request that is mm -hmm. in the in the packet. It looks like three coaches at approximately 850 per per coach. Our coaches in this district um, given an allotment of funds for training each year. I believe they just um have the regular budget and they decide how to allocate that budget. So it's not necessarily a, a line item, but they have the budget they can work within. I do believe we need to make a decision this evening because uh, the travel is for March 24th. So I don't think there'll be enough time at our next board meeting. Okay, so Mr. Meyer, I'll leave it to you. Would you like to make a motion on how to proceed or anyone else? Well, you wanna... we, we could um, we could uh, we could take one through seven and nine and pull out eight to separate vote if you, if you like. Maybe we'll do that. Okay, yeah. I'll make a motion to approve to the travel request <clears throat> request as presented one through seven and number nine. <clears throat> okay, we have a motion to approve one through seven. Um, and number, nine, and number and nine. number nine. And we'll hold out number eight. Do we want to do that as a separate vote? We'll do that as a separate okay. vote. All right. We have the motion. We'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye for the first uh, one through seven and nine. Aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. I'll make a motion for approval of travel request number eight. Okay. We have a motion on that. We'll go ahead and vote for number eight. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Okay, sounds like motion carries four one. All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and move on to, is there more action items here? No. That's all of them. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to item number eight on the agenda. Action, I mean, items arising. Dr. Finch? Uh, no items. All right, right anyone now. else? All right, we'll move on to item number nine, superintendent's report. I provided a written report, but just wanted to highlight that we continue the work on equity and inclusion uh, as we focus on inclusion and having students have access to the, all students access to the curriculum. Um, we continue to see universal design for learning as a strategy to do that. 
Um, of course, in education, it seems like we always have buzzwords, but uh, the universal design for learning, uh, to me, it's having multiple ways that students can access the curriculum. So they can have it from a, a video lecture, they can have it from reading, uh, just a variety of ways of accessing the content. And then also having a variety of ways that they can demonstrate their learning. So they can do it through a video, they can do it through uh, a written report or other ways to demonstrate their learning. In addition, uh, universal design for learning principles uh, include providing students a variety of ways to monitor their own progress so that students uh, can develop their executive function and they can take ownership for their learning. Uh, really appreciate the work that Lucas Jager and Kevin Brennan from our Department of Student and Family Support have done this work to identify exemplary schools in Washington State. Uh, they're looking for schools that have similar size to West Valley schools so that similar size staffing or size student population so that we can really relate to the programs that are at those schools. So I did want to share with the board, uh, these exemplary schools are McMinnon Heights Elementary in Highline, Ruby Bridges Elementary in North Shore. The middle school exemplar is Chase Middle School in Spokane, and the high school is Seahome High School in Bellingham. So those are schools um, that we've been able to identify that we would want to have more of our staff go and visit and do those site visits and see how the inclusion practices are done in practice. And so just wanted to give the board an update on that. We are planning to have a program in May. So there was one of our speakers said that they would like to have a program about uh, equity and inclusion. So we have that on the agenda in May to share the work that we're doing with our work group and plans that we have for the upcoming year. But I did want to share kind of a, a mid check here in March that um, universal design for learning does uh, seem to be a practice that is promising. Uh, it would fit in with the work that we've been doing with student ownership for learning and having a variety of ways that students access the curriculum. And so I just wanted to share that with you um, that we're moving forward with looking at these exemplary schools and there are some site visits planned for the spring. And that's my report. Any questions for Dr. Finch? All right, thank you, Dr. Finch, for that. Uh, moving on, item 10 on the agenda, board development, board reports. I, Anyone? Just, I had one thing real quick. Uh, really nice article in the paper about this is the last week of masks, and starting Monday, we'll be without masks. And the last quote was a West Valley teacher, and I can't remember her name. Tiffany, Tiffany Williams, who I worked with for about 15 years. Nice that next Monday, all of these come off and her, question, her comment was, we can finally see the kids smile again. Uh, it's gonna be a great end of the year. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dave. All right. Well, thank you for that reminder. Uh, Michael has Mr. Jager. Oh, Michael. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a, a report if I may. Um, last, last Thursday uh, and over the weekend, uh, I had the pleasure of, of attending the West Valley School District's uh, presentation of Matilda. And I could go on and on about how wonderful of a program uh, that was and what exceptionally talented students we have in our, in our, in our school district. But there was something that uh, I wanted to, I wanted to highlight that brought a, a smile to my face. Um, my daughter has participated in the musical for the school district for over the, for the last eight years. And this year, I, I understand that we tried something where we did something different this year. And that was that if you were a student with B, you could come for free, just like you could if you present an ASB and went to a basketball game or wrestling or football game or, or what have you. And every one of the four shows was sold out and packed. But what was especially cool was the student support supporting their fellow students at, this, at, at these shows. It was absolutely awesome. And um, I was so pleased to see that we, we had done that and, um, and that kids took advantage of that. It was a wonderful show and the student support of their fellow students was um, terrific. So um, I'm just really grateful for um, whoever came up with that idea, brilliant. 
Um, those are great opportunities uh, for, for our students and uh, to support one another. So thank you. I'd like to echo what Mr. Thorner said. I took my family, some friends from the community, and well, we had 10 of us there, I think, on Saturday at the matinee, and we're absolutely blown away with the amount of talent and the choreography and all of it, the way it was put together. There was no doubt in my mind how many hours of hard work had been put in by all of the folks involved in that production. It was an hour and a half, two hours, I think, we got out of there, but time well spent. And I knew seven or eight of the participants, kids of friends of mine and peers and cohorts. It was fantastic to see what those kids put into that production. You know, and, and I'm sorry to say that those of you who didn't have the opportunity to to view it really missed out because it was well worth the time. So I just want to give a shout out to everybody that had something to do with that production. Okay, thank you. Again, those are just outstanding examples of some of the great endeavors taking place in the West Valley School District. Uh, even though I wasn't there, I just know how these individuals who speak so highly of it must have felt and how strong the event must have been carried out. So thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna add another one. Um, our last board meeting, I said I was gonna have the opportunity to judge uh, Mr. West Valley. And uh, it was a full house here. Um, I think the final number was $28,005, if I recall correctly, that the boys raised. And not just the boys, I'm sorry, the, uh, the young ladies that are the coordinators as well. Um, and you talk about, Mr. Meyer talked about the number of hours to put in, to put on a quality show. Um, I'm sure that they did the thing uh, for for Mr. West Valley, the uh, being able to include um, smaller children um, in part of their their presentation um, was was fun to see their their personalities come out. The talent that the boys had, you could see the personalities come out. Um, but when they did the uh, their heroes section, um, I think there was plenty of tears in the audience from um, just the stories that we heard from brothers and sisters and grandmothers and mothers and fathers and um, being able to be part of those those kids moment for a second. So um, it's it's been a great thing that uh, the the Memorial Foundation has been doing with um, its Children's Miracle Network and uh, the amount of money that they raise for families that are in, in need. I get to sit next to a family who um, had one of the um, the children that was. Um, that was uh, spot several years ago, and uh, um, just neat stories to to hear about um, how proud they are of their kids and what that money does for their families. So, again, it was it was a it was a great show. Okay, thank you. Um, good things again going on in West Valley. It's always a pleasure to hear about those things. Uh, anyone else? Okay, hearing none from anyone else, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight and participating, and we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. It is 8.13 p.m. Thank you.